the worst parts about making videos on live service games is that they're always changing. I could talk smack about any Apex Legends character I can think of, but tomorrow they could have a tactical laser from the sky or a new name. That's not the case here because, as everyone is so happy to remind me, Overwatch is dead. And that's what makes it interesting. The lifespan of games that go on forever hasn't really been figured out yet. The closest we have is World of Warcraft and EVE Online, but bro, I ain't going in there. You wanna know why I replayed Overwatch? Because I just wanted something with lower stakes. Every game is like, do it. Make a goddamn mistake. We'll blow your head off. And sometimes, I just wanna respawn. Maybe my team pulls through. Maybe they don't. Though at least I don't have to worry that this is the corner that leaves me scrolling through Twitter for three more minutes. So what is Overwatch? It's a 6 versus 6 team-based hero shooter in the spirit of TF2. You pick between over 32 heroes and battle over an objective, be that a capture point, payload, or capture point again. Made by Blizzard Interactive. Oh, man. Well... Overwatch is a controversial game for both its insanely addictive, complicated game systems and potential to irritate beyond measure, alongside the newfound infamy of its company. Though to understand Overwatch, we need to go through its history. This can't be the longest video though, so I guess we'll have to cut out the fucking Sombra ARG. 2016 seems like it wasn't all that long ago, but you need to remember, even if it felt like God hated you less back then, that doesn't mean everyone else didn't. Not even talking about Trump. Overwatch existed at the same time as Harambe memes, Pokemon Go, the war for net neutrality, and FUN GAME in fact, being 19 at the time, and the game releasing in the spring, I distinctly remember Overwatch fondly, with things like Cool Summer Air, and a time when I had less responsibility. I wasn't the type to keep up with online games at the time because I was a good gamer, then one day at GameStop I saw this large cardboard cutout of Tracer, and something about it felt so... off. It felt factory made, but also alluringly attractive, like the warm hands of corporate love telling me that they figured it out. Then, a month later, my friends and I are sitting at a Buffalo Wild Wings, and the PC gamer basically jumps out of his seat to tell us that after we're leaving, we gotta go back to my place and play the Overwatch beta, cause he loves to ruin perfectly fucking good plans. And the thing about playing an Overwatch beta with other people in the room is that everyone is saying you suck when they barely know what sucking is. Also, let it be on record that the first hero I tried was Tracer, cause whatever catches your eye first says a lot about you. See, they tried Hanzo first, which means that they were raised to be a burden to the people around them. Also, I did boot up the beta all these years later to see what actually happens, and it's just this screen. Just as a small aside, by some miracle I managed to save some old Overwatch footage, but I really didn't know how to record games back then, so it looks a bit like ass. Cause if God didn't hate me in 2016, my file compression certainly did. Then, May 24th rolled around. Start of my college semester, and like, I'm just a fucking pizza guy, dude. I rotated between my rotting Nissan Sentra and my stolen gamer chair. I am to Blizzard what young talent is to also Blizzard. And now we reach the crux of the problem. That corporate promise was good. Really fucking good. I think this game is pretty fun. It's got an extreme level of polish that makes it tickle my brain. I wish I was not that guy, but I am. I see something perform well and has purpose in its design. Screw it, I'll buy the loot box. I think it's time we actually start to discuss what Overwatch is and how it plays. Though it has been on screen several times, so I'm going to assume you've been blindfolded. Overwatch is a game that prioritizes player feel over a lot of things, and it shows. Every factor of this game feels as if it was focus tested by every human being on Earth. Most of the abilities have been rounded out and feel about as defined as they can be. When you boot up Overwatch, it can be a bit overwhelming. Even back when there were only 21 heroes, the differences between them are night and day. One moment you could be playing a thin character with a small health pool that lives or dies on her mobility, another you could be a grumpy old man with a machine gun that sits in the back line. Hell, even playing Healer, a class known for being ubiquitously boring and for the guys who have to go to bed early that night was considered fun. Each character comes with a unique gun, two abilities, give or take, and an ultimate that recharges with time. Most of these center around murder, but how much you kill is never as important as taking that point. Sure, they lead into one another, but one doesn't always guarantee the other. If you take out three players, you still need to push off the tanks and take over. This probably doesn't seem exceptionally revolutionary today, but this was the grassroots of the multiplayer boom that Overwatch preceded. To add to that list, Overwatch existed in a time before Player Unknown's Battlegrounds, and Evolve was the biggest laughingstock. The most unique gameplay people saw from multiplayer titles was likely cozily enjoyed from the creatures who... Uh, Oh, wow. What I'm clumsily shotgunning my way to is that people playing Overwatch had to learn and unlearn some things. Acting as a team was important, staying on the objective was paramount, and more damage wasn't always the solution to victory. Of course, then, as people do, we began to find little reasons to hate Overwatch. The biggest criticisms are in the game's balance, particularly in three places. Certain heroes, the capture point game mode, and ultimates. 
And when I say certain heroes, I'm sure you know which one I'm talking about. For what it's worth though, everyone has certain heroes in Overwatch that they hate. In fact, I would give my entire life to ensure that Junkrat players go to hell and don't come back. But I'll settle for a bus hitting Farah and Zarya players too. And the answer is countering. Overwatch was built upon the idea that hero swapping would ensure any character you find obnoxious is a solvable problem. Whenever you're in the spawn lobby, you can pop off your current hero and grab another. For example, I hate Junkrat because he's very good at killing flanking heroes with one bomb, then tossing out his mind like the skillless fuck he is. If I wasn't busy racing towards a Zarya player, and became one, I'd be able to absorb that explosive damage and deal some of my own. As for the two capture point, no one cares. But I want to touch on the last bit of Overwatch that drove people up the wall. Ultimates. Every hero in Overwatch has an ultimate. This charges as they fulfill their role. For example, dealing damage as Soldier 76 or healing as Mercy. Then, by pushing Q, you trigger a super powerful ability. And by powerful, I mean if you use this in the best way possible, you can end up killing every single player on the enemy team. Maybe that's not enough, so let me describe a few. 76 is given an aimbot and increased reload speed, allowing him to take out other players in less than 3 seconds flat. Diva can self-destruct her mech and instantly kill every hero that takes the blast head on. Zenyatta becomes invincible and opens up a giant healing field that outheals close to every damage dealing ability in the game, and those are just the ones that sound overpowered. You still have ones like Zarya's that create a gravity field that forces the enemy team into a small space, which can be easily nullified by barriers, but if you combo it with Sombra's EMP that disables all abilities, then you can team wipe faster than you could say Widow do something useful. All of these being permanent problems depends on what kind of company you're dealing with. Some multiplayer games see problems and go, Ah, yeah, alright. Maybe those will work themselves out. Blizzard did not let things go unnoticed. The first few months of Overwatch saw some pretty consistent changes. Around one of the first things they hammered down on was duplicate heroes. This sounds probably a bit hard to imagine, but people used to be able to select their hero without any limits. If you're a Genji main and there's another Genji main, the two of you can play together. Until you couldn't anymore, with one of the first patches removing this. And I'm of two minds on this change. I totally get why the dev team would want to balance for one hero on each team, because then you don't have to plan for scenarios where you have five Swedish gremlins and one fair maiden, versus six players thinking that they're fucking hilarious. Hypothetically, the solution would be for one person on the other team to double down and counter that hero, but this didn't happen and you'd end up with some very boring compositions consisting entirely of the same heroes. On the other hand, if you want to call me an idealist, fine. But I'd enjoy a world where you could make the best of a bad composition. I enjoy the spice and randomness of it all. I like to see underdog stuff come out on top. There's this metaphor I really like in terms of online games. If you have a frog and a pot of hot water and really want to boil him alive for some reason, throwing him in the pot is a bad idea. He'll freak and jump out. But, if you put him in a lukewarm pot of water, and slowly turn up the heat, he'll sit there and wonder why his teammates aren't doing anything about it. The other thing that Blizzard Focus Testing wanted to fix was some of the more annoying heroes, specifically one like McCree, who could fire every bullet in his chamber in an instant, then roll to reload just as instantly and do it again. Followed up by his non-existent damage falloff meant he was out sniping the snipers. And finally, a slightly controversial change, where sentry turrets were nerfed, but only on console. <laughs> which is like the hand of corporatism grabbing you by the throat and saying, you're garbage and even we know it. Talking of character updates brings probably the biggest reason Overwatch lasted forever and seemed indomitable. It's patches. Back then, it wasn't unheard of to patch in new things, but Overwatch was likely a console player's first taste of the model that most games would follow. Every three months or so, a giant update would drop. Christ, just a month after the game released, we got Anna a new hero. Compare that to the feeling you got playing all those original 21 heroes, getting a 22nd and hearing that even more were on the way was intense. Not to mention that she was damn close to meta-defining. You guys will never know the game. When a new character comes out and everyone is trying to play them in a real match, so there's a round table of glances silently in the loading screen. A building anticipation. Then boom, hero select. You move that mass as fast as you can to get to them and remove yourself from the in-game chat because one guy is gonna bust out his fucking puppy dog voice. Hey man, could I please have Anna? I didn't get her last game and haven't got a chance to use her yet. Sombra, the hero they released after that, is my favorite. In all honesty, she's just what I'm used to playing at this point. To introduce this character into the game, Blizzard put out a lengthy ARG. Everyone hated it, but it was my first one. So every afternoon, I'd refresh the YouTube channel. Hello, welcome to you to Lost. My name is Stylos. At this point in time, I was really just enjoying Overwatch, okay? So I'm eating wings one day and poof, she's out. Next thing we know, we're huddled in my friend's car, hearing all the details of her kit get dripped out after we watched her animated short on a screen too small for it. She was just so cool that I needed to play her. And when it turned out she was terrible, that was motivating. I could be a part of the people who unraveled her. 
and I fucking did. Sombra is a stealth-based character who functions like an offensive support. She'll turn invisible, leave a tracking marker that can be teleported to later, and most importantly, channel a hack. The hack would silence the hero you cast it on, removing all of their abilities for its 5 second duration. And a lot of heroes are insanely dependent on those powers including Sombra. The reason she was so garbage was that her only tool was a medium damage machine pistol, and compared to the guns like Soldier 76's rifle, you might as well be manifesting bad energy their way. So the key to playing her correctly wasn't just landing the hack, but using it at a moment where your team could make up for the damage that you couldn't deal. But the nail in the coffin for my addiction was her highlight intro. Okay, slight topic shift. When a match of Overwatch ends, you are treated to the play of the game, a highlight generated by the AI which finds a decisive epic moment and trims it into a clip for everyone in the match to watch. Every hero in Overwatch would have special preludes that triggered for the characters who got the play. These are very dynamic and awesome to look at. Then you've got Sombra's hacking, which shows another person's play of the game, then boom, Sombra comes in and steals it. So you do the math. A character with low damage and impact with a highlight intro that directly insults someone else, and you have the ultimate, yeah, that's right, your team did have a Sombra, baby! With each new hero, we also synced our lives up to the events of Overwatch. Summer would roll around and they would dress everyone up in beachwear and bring in Lucio Ball, which made everyone happy. Hell, I thought it was cool, though. Once people started playing it like an actual video game, it drove me insane. We'll get into playing Overwatch competitive later, but people took the same try-hard attitude to the dumb soccer game mode. And if you ever ask for a jerk's guide to Rocket League, I'm gonna start gunning for you, too. These updates, these events, these new heroes, this was the story of Overwatch. Sure, the game had its own story, and it was beautifully animated, but it was not what people came for. If you asked a lot of people about the story of Overwatch, they could tell it's about a crime-fighting organization, and there's the Detroit Become Human metaphor with the Omnics, but it was a lot of surface-level understanding. So when I say that Overwatch's story was told in its updates, I think it fits a lot more. Sure, it doesn't star Tracer as the main character, but it was also a story that lived on through the love that its community showed. There were tons of mini-episodes every day, like the time the game's director roasted some Someone on a forum, the same game's director sitting there unflinchingly for hours every Christmas. Then we had our YouTuber friend clip his voice into a raging sexual innuendo. I just want to let you know that, you know, if I go down, I'm taking Blizzard down with me. It was amazing how we all got our friends to pay so much attention to this insanely fun game. So I'm sitting there with some other pals at the end of the year watching the Game Awards, doubling down on those 10 pounds that I still never got rid of, and somehow, Overwatch wins Game of the fucking Year? What? That was unheard of, dude! For a game without a story mode and just multiplayer, ever since Naughty Dog hit the scene, I expected the award to be some Oscar bait. And you know what? I want to go back to that time, because every game wants to be Overwatch but less fun now. We kept getting events. Junkenstein's Revenge, The Archives, one dude I knew spent $20 just to get the Reaper pumpkin skin, and he still didn't get it. We totally accepted this manufactured thing into our lives, and someone else wasting money on it became hilarious. It just seemed unstoppable. Except... that... Time didn't really go on forever. Overwatch was abandoned for Rainbow Six Siege later that year. Then Rainbow for Dead by Daylight. Then DVD for Valorant. Then Val for Destiny 2. Doomfist came out and there was maybe a few weeks I played with him, but the spark I thought was there maybe wasn't. I don't know what games you play, but if you're in the online sphere, you likely have that one multiplayer game. You love it, but it makes you really angry sometimes. Some guy calls you a gay boy and dangles his golden limbs in your face, but you don't have a good retort. Or Junkrat still hasn't been set to hell yet. The thought of deleting it, making a pivot in your life, and spiting the game and its developers by never playing it again crosses your mind. And maybe you're a fucking Giga Chad with supreme will, but I wasn't. That big moment of self-improving revenge just never came. I didn't play it for a week, then two, then a month, and a game dropped with a big storage capacity. I said I'd move Overwatch off my console for a little bit to play Uncharted 4, told myself I'd come back to it eventually, and then four years passed. I turned it off one day and then just didn't turn it back on. I didn't have a revelation and boldly declared that I'm free. Something else just grabbed my attention and didn't let go for it long enough for me to realize that Overwatch wasn't a big enough deal to me anymore. If you want me to be clinical, I'd say the two big things that made me quit was burning myself out of the competitive play by climbing to Masters, and my friends leaving it behind for Rainbow Six Siege and Dead by Daylight. But at the end of the day, every single one of those 4,000 hours, I didn't know that they were leading to what was effectively an anti-climax. That's what Overwatch was. But that isn't what it is anymore, at least not in its entirety. I'm back. I installed it on PC for the purpose of having something free to play, since I can't afford money games or convince my friends to take the risk with me. Then the cynical thought of fixing one of those problems crossed my brain and well, 
I told you how I feel about my own willpower, right? A lot of Overwatch has remained intact on the surface, but it's 2022, and if God hates you now, guess what Blizzard thinks? This is effectively a land of people who have all quit Overwatch at some point and the few that haven't are given a big platinum border and a target on their backs. Me, I'm technically a smurf, but only because I moved to PC. That said, I empathize with a lot of these people. I started playing the game again in mid-January, and if you see the release date on this video, no, I really didn't go more than three days apiece without firing it up again. Hell, from my spark alone, I have gotten pretty much every single one of my other friends to reinstall Overwatch. And if you know me personally, that is fucking saying something. Coming back, the five big things I had to adjust to were the five new heroes and a handful of new maps. Though when I started it up, those were not the changes I noticed first. Now when you boot up, you queue into three roles. Support, tank, and attack and defense have been merged into one role called damage. This effectively means that you're limited to a character within a certain category and cannot change that category. Which is just... Uh, disappointing. To me only, really. And the other creative souls out there. Overwatch was never a very lenient game, but the privilege to swap out your role felt like the last bit of player agency. Now it's been sucked out and systematized. Granted, this was an inevitable change change, really. The frog in the pot can't live forever. From the small moment they made it so that you couldn't pick duplicate heroes in ranked, this was always going to be the end result. How is it in practice? Alright, your team will never fumble in comp because some guy firmly believes that he can do better, but with this we can't ever break out of 2-2-2. Two, two, two. You can't do triple or even quadruple anything. I know a lot of people like this change, but I think it makes for a less exciting experience. There's no funny or exciting moments where the thing out of left field is what makes the plays. This is just the box where Overwatch happens now. The biggest change that real people care about is the new heroes. I quit somewhere after Doomfist was added in, so I had to become familiar with Moira, Brigitte, Wrecking Ball, Ash, Baptiste, Sigma, and Echo. Seven heroes out of 32 might not seem that intense, but when people have a lamp over their heads and it means that they'll never die, you better study up, fucko. They're fun, but I can tell that they're designed differently. A lot of their ultimates are on the weaker side of things. They're built to fit inside the rules Overwatch has already established, not to be eye-catching or draw in players with a specific fantasy. Like, Baptiste is fun, but he's just a cool medic dude. There's no real idea behind him. Echo's entire character trait is just her ultimate, and Sigma's powers are based on gravity, but he's mostly known as being a frontal shield guy. This also might be the product of being here at the end, though. Brigitte and Baptiste used to be insanely strong supports, but had to be nerfed down, and now the EMT can barely afford to treat someone every 30 seconds. Although maybe I'm just bitter that Blizzard seemed so eager to nerf, but never to buff. I briefly discussed how you play Overwatch, but here is how you play Overwatch. I already told you I like Sombra, I'm not subtle about it. That said, I hate Mercy mains more than anything, so I'm gonna throw out that I'm not a one-trick player. She was just my favorite. On tank, I play Orisa, cause her halt is, was, very fun, and Sniper Mercy on support as she's probably the most unique character Overwatch has. Though she's the one hero nobody plays the way Blizzard intended them to. Instead of finding a sniper perch far off in the distance to heal away from danger, Anna was often played grouped up in her team cause they're fucking sheep. I want to talk about the competitive rules here too, cause this was how people found their worth. And did I mention I was the Masters console Sombra player? Yeah I know, being a yeek is awesome. Sadly I didn't get vindication on PC, instead I was in the mines with the other 90% of the player base. Silver and By booting up competitive, you end up in the neighborhood where people take Overwatch very seriously. And those mines are pumping out some pretty heavy fumes. Remember how I mentioned those three problems at the start? Bad heroes, bad maps, and ultimates? There was a fourth I was hiding from you. Toxic ass people. Things might start cool in the spawn room, as you're all listening to the soothing beats of And they say, and they say, and they say, and Though by the end of it, it'll turn into Among Us, as people pass the blame along trying to find the person at fault. And it might be you. Losing at Overwatch has a very specific feeling to it. It. it doesn't make a lot of sense, abilities fly out and just get you. Despite having a higher time to kill than other games, Overwatch can decide to whittle down your health in a flash if it wants to. Some of it is very cut and dry, like Cassidy's flashbang which stuns you for a brief period of time, like half a second, giving the guy a moment to follow it up with that alternative fire of his, and locking you into guaranteed death. Or Echo, who can fly up to you, attach 8 sticky bombs, then start firing a beam that deals 3 times the damage when you're under half health. This being the newest hero, by the way, probably means that instant kills are just a part of Overwatch forever, like I'm playing Persona 3 again. Roadhog can do it too, with a notorious hook that pulls you towards him and right into the big circle of his shotgun, or if he's feeling funny, the edge of a cliff. Which leads to the other big problem. The tanks in this game are about as strong as the DPS heroes. Blizzard seems to understand that people feel good when they're doing important things, but to require all the other 
players to spend minutes spamming damage into a shield only to get instantly killed by a charge, well, it didn't feel that great. If you want to win Overwatch, there's obviously the score, but there's something hidden underneath that, a morale meter. See, I know people complain about being stuck in their ranks, but I firmly believe there's no such thing as a decided match in Overwatch. If you can pull out the right words in the dialogue tree and get people to swap their heroes in concert with what the team needs, you can turn most games around. Except that happening is dependent on whether or not the five strangers feel like they can win this too. Remember that episode of Fairly Odd Parents where Timmy plays with those basketball players and they only say, my ball, and beat the shit out of each other? That's your team. And you can convince them that winning is an option, but you have to give them a reason to believe. It was very momentum-based in a way. If your team rolls the first two points, everyone's gonna be throwing out the platitudes. But Mercy keeps getting hit with the funny? Oh boy, it's gonna start. There was some controversy over the medal system. This was mostly taking the form of, I'm Reinhardt, why do I have the gold medal? I'm obviously better than you. Could you DC from the game then stop your heart? Some people said that Overwatch's toxicity stems from its lack of a traditional scoreboard, but I passionately disagree. When people are mad, they don't look at solutions, they look at causes. And a scoreboard that shows your Soldier 76 has barely killed anything would only exist to give Reinhardt someone to isolate and yell at with cause. Even though that soldier isn't likely a bad player, he's just in the wrong circumstances. The thing going wrong in your match can be a lot of things. The best metric for me is to look at the on fire system. Yeah, this copium tastes great by the way. A meter under your hero that takes into account specific things that those heroes are good at and rates how you're doing. Obviously if you are losing, no one is on fire, but by virtue that means people on the enemy team are on fire giving you a good target to work towards. Tank heroes will always have my ire because you can never pin down when they're the reason your team is losing. Depending on who gets angry, the heat will usually go to the DPS or the support because the game actively tells you how they're doing. To tell if the tanks are throwing, you need to become in tune to the flow of battle. It's about figuring out if engagements ever even start, or if people are just getting yoinked into the death ball, never to be seen again. And by now, I think the poor heroes of Overwatch could use a break. As for the tanks, it's about creating space. But most of the people playing this game are just concerned if their enemy team's health bars are going down, or if theirs are going up. So what I'm saying is, the next time you're losing, just yell at Reinhardt. Then mute him immediately, because I can promise he's louder than you. If you're ever in a toxic match, I will bet you money that the guy being an asswipe is a tank. If he isn't staying alive, he'll say that the support should be smacked in the face. If he has gold damage, the attack characters are fucking idiots, and he will have gold damage because the tanks are just as, if not more, offensive than most of the DPS heroes. The big moment is obviously at the end of the match, where the gloves come off, and then, the thought you've been molding can finally come out. You either glare at the screen and swallow it, culminating in the day where you kill your spouse, or you let them have it. And as they say, chivalry, chivalry is dead. Yeah. See, Overwatch is like a microcosm. Little societies, personalities, and memes came from it. And one day, they threw out the bread. After Echo came out, Blizzard said, that's it. No more. New heroes and maps would cease. Events would be recycled, only giving new skins in loot boxes. This is what ended Overwatch permanently. A lot of people probably had the same experience I did, where they didn't quickly drop it but slowly walked away. However, reaching the end of the road permanently? Being told that there's nothing else to look forward to? Only for it to become insanely weird when Blizzard, the company everyone loved so much, showed what was inside the hand of corporate love. This happening a year after Overwatch's last hero, in a time where a lot of people knew what Overwatch was, but weren't fond of it anymore, it was probably the perfect story. One that is likely to burn slowly and awkwardly. One of the motivations for making this video was the death of a game, Overwatch, by Nerd Slayer Studios. A video I find passionately researched and way more. But there's something I can't get out of my head. It's in the title, Death, alongside the same sentiments repeated over and over. The game died. Overwatch failed because. And look, I really don't care if someone shit talks a game I liked once. I think Overwatch will be fine somehow. Hell, I got the vibe that the guy loved Overwatch at some point, and doesn't really need to have his work framed as the Overwatch takedown video. I guess I'm just iffy on this obsession we have with the concept of a fall from grace. Overwatch is dead in the most literal terms that it is not being updated anymore, though it consistently keeps up with TF2. When I think of games that have failed and died, I think of Anthem. Things people were wary of, didn't like it when it was released, and despite the hardest effort of the bad guys, never escaped the void. The problem is, Overwatch put itself on hiatus. This was not some company siphoned of money, drained of human willpower, and just wanted to get this thing out of everyone's way. A team shifted off to make a sequel. But even then, even if that wasn't the case, that's not a failure of a game. Overwatch made people happy and built a cultural touchstone. Just because it's over doesn't mean it was a bad thing. I don't like how we need to frame the inevitable end of a piece of media to be an embarrassing failure. And if the story of Overwatch was written by the love in its community, would it kill us to decide it's a happy ending? Oh right, I did say there was a sequel.
Fuck it, I'll stay up all night. Overwatch 2 seems to be all I wanted from the game. It's taking a stronger approach to story-based missions, allowing for an actual narrative to be told and to let people appreciate the lore on a deeper level. And I'm hyped for that because even though the heroes have to be balanced for PvP, shooting at robots can be fun without stop. Based on some of the upgrade trees I've seen, it seems like the game is planning to take that with the cathartic thrill of also Activision Blizzard. But PvP, the main reason people played the game, doesn't look very improved. And I have my suspicions on the one tank policy. Now you have to balance the tanks to do the job of two players. They were always a problem because they gotta be impactful enough to feel fun to play, but also weak enough to incentivize the others to play DPS heroes. On the other hand, people will finally start blaming the tank for a change. This does ripple to the Overwatch League too, whatever's left of it, as this change has effectively cut 50% of the tank mains off their teams. And what about all those content creators from back in the day? Stylosa providing constant updates, Dino Flask putting down Hanzo mains, and Lonehawk failing to be funny. The game that it was all based around had died, meaning that their entire world was shaken up. And no shade to any of them, I'm just trying to get some... Perspective. Well, believe it or not, I'd say Overwatch's impact on the world around it was mostly positive. A lot of people who started off on Overwatch have launched into sterling careers like the very ironically named Moon Moon OW and Hell XQC. The game did prove that these big live services could succeed. Again, not the first, but the boom of Overwatch felt like the last push for the casual audience to start consuming them en masse. Don't get me wrong, the sustainability and community of Overwatch was awesome for the long time it stayed with me, but I want art that communicates traditional narratives too. The question for a lot of people is, will Overwatch 2 be good? A soul to burn on the fire and extend the flame, or dead hard absolution? Except I don't really buy any of that. The problem isn't specifically that Overwatch died. It's that 2016 died. My friends and I are out of community college. We can't spend every afternoon at the Buffalo Wild Wings. They're still around and they're still great, but some of us are getting married. We have jobs, but the time where we can even just hang out in person is getting farther and farther away. For God's sake, the idea of taking the rare moments our schedules line up and sitting in a room playing Overwatch together would ruin perfectly good plans. The period where Overwatch was a fun thing to burn my time on isn't there. I gotta write about it instead. The anniversary events are my favorite because they bring back everything. The modes swap every day. It's Lucio Ball one day, Junkenstein's Revenge the next, the story missions another, with every skin, voice line, and highlight intro in the loot boxes. The fact that all my friends came back to enjoy it with me was really nice too. I wouldn't mind having something new to enjoy again if I get into the Overwatch 2 beta, especially if I could make a video on it and relate it to 2022 things like bowling balls, 9-11 memes, the Morbius Discord, and still Pokemon Go. And I won't take it to heart if Overwatch 2 sucks. If Overwatch 2 dies, because if it does, I'm still not going in there.